Shall we start, Milan? Up to you. So, if you want me to start, I can start. All right. Okay. Uh, good morning, yes. everybody, or good evening, wherever, whatever time zone you are in. Uh, as director of Circus, the Center for Research and Computation in Society, I'm really delighted to welcome you all. Uh, this event today. With the seminar of uh, Dr. Kushwarshne. We have a month long uh, celebration of AI for social impact. Uh, so we have a seminar series, we have rising star panels, we have uh, AI for health equity panels and many other events. And I'm very grateful for uh, our team, Arpita, uh, Harman um, and Shalmali to have organized this uh, set of events as well as um, you know, there's a, another team that's been organizing the Rising Star event. So I hope you will all attend all of these events. With that brief uh, introduction, I'm going to hand this over to Arpita to introduce uh, the speaker we have for today, Dr. Kushwarshne. Over to you, Arpita. Thank you, Milind. Um, yeah, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kushwarshne today. Um, so Dr. Kush uh, Vashne is a distinguished research staff member and manager with IBM Research at the Thomas J. Watson Research Center um, in New York. He leads the machine learning group in the foundations of trustworthy AI department. He is the founding co-director of the IBM Science for Social Good Initiative. He applies data science and predictive analytics to human capital management, healthcare, computational creativity, public affairs, and uh, algorithmic fairness, which has led to recognition such as 2013 Gerstner Award for uh, Client Excellence for Contributions to the WellPoint team, the extraordinary IBM Research Technical Accomplishment for Contributions to Workforce Innovation and Enterprise Transformation, and also the Harvard Belfort Center Tech Spotlight Runner-Up for AI Fairness 360. His research received several best paper awards and also the 2019 Computing Community Consortium Computer Science for uh, Social Good White Paper Competition Award. He is currently writing a book entitled Trustworthy Machine Learning, and we are eagerly waiting to learn more from him. So without um, much ado, I mean, I'll, I'll switch it over to uh, Kush. Great, thank you, Arpita. Thanks, Milan. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, so let me start sharing my screen. Um, all right. Okay, so um, yeah, the title of the talk is uh, a bit hard to parse. Uh, there's lots of words, so I kind of color coded it. So, um, so it's lessons from bottom of the pyramid innovation for AI for social good. So, um, uh, so that I mean, bottom of the pyramid innovation is one phrase. AI for social good is another phrase, and um, we're going to see how they uh, connect to each other. Okay. Um, and yeah, please feel free to interrupt with any questions or comments throughout our turn. Um, so in terms of the outline, I'll begin with a few introductory examples and then um, move on to discussing uh, certain aspects of the AI for social good movement um, and then describe bottom of the pyramid innovation and how we can um, uh, use those sort of ideas uh, to help us in this AI for social good movement. Okay. Um, so the first example, uh, so this is the very first uh, data science or AI for social good project that I did. Um, uh, so this was back in 2013, um, and it was a project I did uh, through Give Directly um, with the uh, partner organization um, uh, or working through data kind. Um, so Give Directly uh, is a nonprofit organization. They're still in existence. Um, and uh, their main idea is to give unconditional cash transfers to poor people around the world. Um, at that time, they were mostly focused on Western Kenya and Eastern Uganda, but they've since expanded uh, quite a bit. Um, so what an unconditional cash transfer is, is that um, they receive donations from people, uh, then they enroll poor households, um, then they just directly transfer the money um, uh, to those poor households and then the recipients are free to use that money to pursue their own goals. And uh, 
one thing people get uncomfortable with sometimes is if you give someone just money, aren't they going to waste it on things that they don't need? Um, uh, but they've done a lot of randomized control trials that show that um, a significant, significant fraction of people um, are uh, doing very important things with the money for, for their own goals. Right? Um, and uh, the other thing to mention is that um, uh, the problem that we were working on with them was on the uh, enrolling poor households side of things, um, because uh, the uh, I mean their goal is to reach the uh, the poorest of the poor, and uh, there isn't good data um, for that necessarily. Okay. Uh, so they had an existing uh, sort of heuristic of um, who to give um, these cash donations to at that time. Uh, so in Western Kenya, um, people who live under thatched roofs, which is the image on the left, uh, tend to be a little bit poorer than the people who live under metal roofs, which are on the right. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, thatched roofs fall apart every few months and you have to replace them. Uh, you also cannot uh, collect rainwater off of thatched roofs, which you can off of metal roofs, and they also breed mosquitoes, which spread malaria. So um, anyone who really can afford a metal roof does tend to... Um, uh, get one, and so that does indicate some level of uh, of wealth. Um, and it's not something that can be easily gamed. Uh, so if you know that tomorrow someone is going to come check on you um, to see how poor you are, you can't just uh, change your roof immediately. Whereas if you had some assets, that you can, I mean, put them at your uncle's house for the day or something, right? Um, right, so they were already using this as a, um, uh, uh, basically the determination of who receives and who doesn't receive uh, unconditional cash transfer. Uh, since then, in recent years, they've changed their um, sort of model a little bit. So everyone in a village does get um, a, uh, uh, an unconditional cash transfer, but at this time, this was their criteria. Um, and uh, the way they would do this is they would send out um, uh, individual people to conduct censuses um, and see if they, uh, I mean, whatever the results are and, uh, and base their donation patterns on that. Um, but it would take multiple weeks and would be biased in various ways and expensive. So uh, what we wanted to help them with was um, uh, to see if we can uh, automate some of this. And uh, it turns out that in satellite imagery, you can tell the difference between thatched roofs and metal roofs very clearly. Uh, so on the left are uh, roofs that have uh, all thatched uh, sort of uh, structures, and on the right there's this really bright white um, uh, image, which is the uh, the metal roof. Okay. Uh, so what we did was um, first we uh, wanted to treat this as a supervised learning problem. So through crowdsourcing, we got a bunch of labels um, of uh, people clicking on roofs, uh, metal roofs versus thatched roofs. And we found that when people are doing crowdsourcing for a social good application, um, they're actually extremely uh, quick at it. Uh, they're also doing an extremely good job for it. So there's some level of intrinsic motivation that, um, uh, that comes about when uh, people are doing uh, crowd work for, uh, for social good, which isn't always the case. Okay. And once we had labels, um, so this was back again, as I said, in 2013. So. Um, this was before uh, the deep learning sort of uh, explosion. Uh, so we used a very old um, machine learning, uh, sorry, very old image processing technique called template matching um, to identify where the uh, potential locations of all of the roofs were um, using, um, I mean, this thing called morphological processing and so forth. And then um, classified those roofs into um, thatched versus metal based on the color distribution. So. Um, as, I, as you could see yourselves, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the metal roofs are white and bright, um, so that shows up in the color distribution. Okay. Um, so based on that, uh, we could very um, scalably predict an entire county in Kenya um, and say where there's a lot of roofs, where a lot of them are metal uh, in proportion and so forth. And then once you combine those two predictions, you can um, uh, have a village prioritization of uh, where should we be um, uh, offering up our uh, cash donations. So these are actual jurisdictional boundaries um, of villages within that county. And as you can see, um, the lighter colored um, areas are in the center. That's the main town of the, um, of the county. 
Um, so the results kind of make sense. And then um, at the bottom, uh, there's this one little enclave, um, which is this little green area out surrounded by dark areas, uh, the brown areas. And this is a good validation for the technique. Um, this is actually a crossroads um, where there is this little town, uh, which, and it's separated out as a separate village exactly because it is a little bit richer and it's at this crossroads. Right? Um, so we did this um, and in 2013, uh, Give Directly uh, piloted this uh, to move about $4 million in, um, uh, in donations to about 50 villages out of the 500 that were in this county. Um, so this was one project that uh, we'll, uh, I'll get um, kind of come back to as a recurring example um, as we go along. Um, second example of, um, uh, of AI for social good, again, this was the second ever project I did in uh, the AI for social good space. Um, and was related to uh, pay-as-you-go solar power um, with this organization called um, Simpa Networks, okay? Uh, so these are all photos I took actually. Um, so uh, on the left, uh, you see um, kind of in a village um, uh, in rural India, this is about 18 kilometers from the city of Aligarh. Um, and you go there, um, they're starting to uh, uh, offer this pay-as-you-go solar power there. Um, so the idea is that um, uh, people who have um, access to grid power, um, but that power doesn't come for many hours, so maybe it only comes for a couple of hours a day. Um, if we give them a solar panel for their house, um, then uh, they can use it for nighttime illumination, for charging their cell phones and so forth. Um, and the nighttime illumination is much safer this way as compared to um, uh, kerosene lamps and so forth. Right? Um, and the biggest problem is that um, uh, the, uh, the, these people don't tend to have uh, all of the capital at any one time to afford the whole solar um, power system at, uh, at once. But if you allow them to give a small um, down payment initially and then uh, small incremental payments over a few years, they can afford these things. So uh, the top right image is the roof of one of the houses. Uh, so that's what the solar panels look like. And then inside the house on the bottom left, it comes in. Uh, and gets uh, kind of transformed uh, in such a way that it can then be used. And then um, on the right, you see, um, so the person in the middle um, who's facing the camera is whose house this is. Um, and he is what's called a village level entrepreneur by Simple Networks. So um, he was the first person in this village to get the solar panel system. And uh, other people come to his house to see um, how it is that uh, uh, that this thing works and whether they should get it themselves and or, or not and uh, uh, he gets a small cut for every person in his village who eventually gets um, the solar panel system okay. uh, and they're given the name Urja Mitra by the way right um, so uh, this progressive purchase financing scheme uh, as I mentioned there's a small down payment incremental payments over a couple of years um, that physical device uh, can actually cut off the load. Um, so, the, I mean, when it's sunny, the solar panel will always be getting power, but um, inside uh, it, uh, that device can be remotely controlled. And so if a person um, has not made their payments, uh, th that can be shut off. And then um, uh, once they have made their payments, again, it can be restarted. Um, and once a person has re fully repaid uh, their system over those two or three years, it becomes so-called unlocked and uh, uh, then they can use that energy free and clear. Okay. Um, so what our task was in the machine learning problem was to predict which customers will fully repay for their systems and which ones will not um, so that they can um, uh, be more sustainable. So they don't want to take on too much debt that, um, uh, that isn't going to get repaid. Okay. Um, so we had a bunch of raw features from a uh, digital application form that they had been using. Um, uh, this is just a very small snapshot of that. Um, and we built a logistic regression model. Um, so uh, one so on the left is the, uh, the the main features and which direction that they're operating in um, whether the coefficient is positive or negative and then we have some categorization some are 
exogenous variables, others are demographic or business or agricultural or um, expense related um, uh, sort of variables. Um, one interesting one is um, uh, the battery expense. So people who have um, what are called inverters in India. Um, so these are battery packs that you can charge while you are getting power and then use while you're not. Um, uh, people who have more inverters um, or spend more on that um, are less likely to repay, which is kind of odd until you think about it. So if you're rich and have inverters, you're not going to pay for um, the, uh, the solar panel system necessarily because you actually have an alternative source um, to, to get the, uh, the nighttime illumination and so forth. Right? Um, so anyways, um, so we built this model. Um, Simpa had been doing this a little bit before we started. Um, and uh, their initial model, actually, if you um, were doing this through cross-validation within um, the, uh, the, the, the partition of the training set, uh, was better than chance, but if you test it in the future, um, it actually was worse than uh, random guessing. Um, and this indicates, I mean, there's obviously some distribution shift happening. Um, and uh, I mean, it's something that we had to deal with uh, in this problem. We didn't explicitly deal with it, but um, just made sure that we were testing in, uh, in this way. Um, then if we look at their prior model, plus um, adding in some exogenous variables, um, we can at least get above chance, uh, so 0.537 on the AUC. Um, and then we include the uh, data from the application form um, that gets us even better. Um, and then all of the data that we have available and that gets us to an AUC of about uh, 0.628 on the future test set. And um, that was, I mean, it's a hard prediction problem. Uh, the data isn't that meaningful, but at least um, it was doing something reasonable and uh, this can really help simple networks. Okay. Okay, um, so that those are just some introductory examples. I think in any sort of AI for good talk, it's good to have some motivation um, at the beginning, but um, I'm not gonna use those um, in the normal sense of, uh, of an example. So you'll see how it is that I'm going to use those to, to motivate what we talk about going forward. Um, but let me talk about the AI for social good movement in general. Um, so we can kind of say that um, this movement is maybe about a, a decade or so old now. Um, uh, so around 2011, uh, Jeff Hammerbacher said that the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads and that it sucks. Um, and that kind of started people thinking about um, uh, what they really want to do with their data science skills. So uh, DataKind um, started in 2012, which is how I got involved. Um, I volunteered with them on those two projects that I talked about. Um, and then uh, Raid Ghani and folks uh, started this uh, Data Science for Social Good Fellowship in 2013 at the University of Chicago. Um, we started our program at IBM Research in 2015. And there's many others, um, I, I don't mean to be exhaustive in any sense. And um, uh, there's all sorts of different modes of, uh, of doing this, including data science competitions, weekend events, longer term um, uh, sort of things. Uh, so those were the two projects that I did with DataKind were uh, these DataKind data core um, projects. Um, uh, there's fellowship programs like we have um, and others have. Um, there's just direct corporate philanthropy, um, different NGOs that are actually focused directly on doing AI for social good. Um, and then there's uh, agencies or, um, I mean, uh, the UN and so forth who have uh, their own innovation units and then uh, data, science, data scientists who are employed directly by um, social change organizations. Okay. Um, so our program uh, at IBM Research, uh, it's now entering its uh, sixth year. Um, we've done something like 35 or so projects with various nonprofit organizations, um, touching many different topic areas. Um, and what we've kind of learned through this uh, is a few different things. Um, so uh, one thing, our own projects um, have tended to be these small one-off custom tailored solutions for individual social change organizations. And um, in doing those, um, and not just us, most of the, um, the projects that you see around are of this type. Um, and what you see in this uh, overall sort of scheme of things is that 
uh, creating these one-off solutions um, requires a great deal of time and a great deal of effort, both from the social change organization, um, providing the subject matter expertise and the data and so forth, um, and also from the data scientists who are um, usually starting from scratch every time because there's limited reuse of assets um, for a few different reasons. One is that um, each project is with a different social change organization, so there's no um, coherence there. Also, the data scientists tend to not be doing multiple projects um, because they are often volunteering, so um, they can't learn from their previous projects either. Um, and it also requires that the social change organization take this custom tailored solution and uh, do the, the difficult part of uh, integrating it with their existing systems, deploying it, monitoring it, maintaining it, and so forth. And um, because of that reason, um, our feeling is that um, really most of the um, these social good projects that have happened over the last uh, decade or so um, have mostly been demonstrations and pilots. Um, they have been successful in starting the dialogue between the social sector and um, researchers and developers in uh, of AI, um, but there's very few examples where you can um, show that there has actually been sustained and meaningful impact. Um, so the Give Directly example that I talked about, um, so we did pilot it back in 2013, but then it didn't go anywhere because of a lot of those last mile problem uh, challenges. Just this year, um, Give Directly announced that um, they are now going to um, use satellite imagery based methods for um, the large scale um, uh, uh, targeting of their donations. So. Uh, basically for like seven or eight years, nothing happened. Um, and uh, that's a problem, right? Um, we, we put in the effort, but it didn't lead to things um, immediately. Uh, same with Simpa Networks. Um, uh, it kind of, we did the pilot. Um, uh, it was useful for them to understand a few different things. The model wasn't rolled out immediately. Um, uh, we kind of pointed out to them that your data collection can be improved because they had a lot of um, uh, free text fields for a lot of those features that we had to manually go in and recode and so forth. So, um, I mean, it was useful, but it wasn't like a deployed solution at the time. And we see this, uh, I mean, across the board. Um, so what can we do about it? What, what are some things that we might want to do differently? So let's start by talking about this idea of uh, bottom of the pyramid innovation, and then um, uh, we'll kind of come to that. And I see there might be some questions in the chat. Um, it's hard for me to share my screen and um, look at the chat at the same time. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, please just unmute yourself and um, feel free to ask. So um, uh, let me pause for a second. Um, so any questions? So let me uh, ask the first question. <laughs> yeah. So very interesting uh, observation that, you know, in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, we've been uh, struggling with this uh, observation as well that that AI researchers, you know, if they're in the R and D business, mm -hmm. they are trying to innovate. They are trying to publish work. Yeah. And the question becomes, how, you know, if uh, if AI is mm -hmm. meant to essentially, uh, you know, AI research is meant to innovate only in the space of AI algorithms and techniques mm -hmm. and so forth. Maybe show some demonstration. Mm -hmm. Where is the, where in your view mm -hmm. is the line where, you know, AI researchers would say, okay, this is all that, you know, this is my, you know, this is where my job ends. Yeah. And now from here onwards, it's not, it's not really AI. And, mm -hmm. you know, like actually demonstrate randomized controlled trials in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, and then building a sustainable system and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's not really what AI researchers should be doing because yeah. that's really beyond AI. Mm -hmm. So I sort of feel like yeah. maybe that is partly what's going on, but I just wanted to hear your view and whether you think this is a good view of AI. Yeah, no, it, it certainly is, I think, a very, I mean, root cause for things as much as other um, sort of components. And so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there is a point at which um, uh, AI researchers, I mean, do have to stop and pass things on to someone else. And um, uh, I think the second half of the talk will kind of talk through what, I mean, what mechanisms those could be. And um, so hopefully um, I, I'll answer that as we go along. Um, yeah. 
Uh, Rahul, any uh, question from you? Yeah, yeah. thank you so much uh, for this presentation. It's really, uh, it's, it's uh, amazing work that you're doing. Um, um, the question I have is, when you initially uh, come mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. these projects, mm -hmm. how do you identify that this project would be a good fit for mm -hmm. as an AI project or machine learning project? The second, yeah. the second question I have is um, that um, what kind of tools after you come up with this model and AUC and everything, mm -hmm. what kind of do you offer tools to the end users mm -hmm. to uh, to take charge of uh, mm -hmm. the make decision making? Basically, yeah. I'm saying like you came up with the model, you put mm -hmm. a dashboard that mm -hmm. these candidates are good for. Mm -hmm. Each, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. whatever the the social good you're doing, but mm -hmm. do you give them in tools at the end to use? Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's exactly the the problem, right? So, uh, that, I think that is one of the missing links, and that's what I'll get to in a second. But um, uh, we don't often, I mean, take it all the way to the end, and um, there might be better ways of doing that. So. Let me get to that in a second. Um, in terms of the problem scoping, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, a very difficult job. So um, the first year we ran the IBM uh, Science for Social Good initiative, um, we talked to probably um, like 100, 150 organizations to get six projects that we did our first year. Um, and even those um, looking back now, five years later, we probably wouldn't have done two or three of them. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, finding that right match is, uh, is a very difficult sort of process. Um, uh, in our minds, we have a few criteria. Um, so one is that uh, the organization should be um, doing some sort of social impact. Uh, that's easily met by most organizations. Um, second is that, uh, they should have some data that's relevant for the project that we're imagining together, um, either their own internal data or open data that they can point to. Um, uh, third is that, yeah, I mean, there should be some technical innovation that um, uh, we're trying to contribute because um, if we have smart PhD students joining us and our permanent researchers working on something, we don't um, want them just to be making a couple of bar graphs and so forth. Um, and then the fourth and most important, I think, is that um, uh, there should be someone in the partner organization um, who is really uh, championing this work, who will be able to put in the time uh, in order to um, uh, actually uh, spend uh, and help us formulate the problem, give us feedback and so forth. Um, so those tend to be our criteria, but um, yeah, it's very, very challenging to, to do so. Um, so yeah, um, let me continue on with the talk. So I kind of pointed a at a problem. So let's uh, see if there's any sort of ideas that we can um, look at in terms of solutions. Right? Um, okay, so if you've never heard of this term, the bottom of the pyramid before, um, uh, so what it refers to is people who are poor um, and low resourced. Um, so this is an image from uh, 2002. Um, uh, and the numbers I'm sure have changed in the last uh, 19 years, but um, the idea is the same, which is that um, a very, very large portion of the world population um, uh, makes less than a dollar a day or less than $2 a day and so forth. Right? Um, so, uh, and obviously, I mean, uh, as should be obvious, um, so the Give Directly and the Simpa um, sort of customers and clients are the examples of those low resourced individuals. Okay. Um, so, what are some noteworthy aspects of how Give Directly and Simpa work? Right? Um, so, one is uh, with Simpa that they offer the cash transfers as unconditional. So, the recipients are empowered to use the funds for their own goals. Um, so, that's an important point to remember. Um, and with Simpa, um, they actually are a very good illustration of uh, bottom of the pyramid innovation. So, um, they have these village level entrepreneurs, as I mentioned. Um, who will explain um, the functionality in the same language as the potential customers and demonstrate its usefulness in their own house, which is in the village. Right? Um, the system itself is easily installed, easy to use, um, and it has an extensible architecture. So um, one of the images I showed, I mean, there's fans and televisions that you can attach to the um, uh, 
uh, to the system as well. And they have these customer relationship associates who will make rounds uh, among the villages that they're supporting and um, try to stop by almost every day with all of the customers um, to make sure there's no issues, um, any sort of maintenance that needs to happen. They are also electricians and stuff. They'll also collect the money um, if the person doesn't want to pay by, by phone and so forth. Okay, so, I mean, there's a, a lot of stuff that's happening here. And um, uh, these all relate to um, uh, these 12 principles of bottom of the pyramid innovation. Um, so I'm not gonna read them aloud, but um, I'll leave this uh, on the screen for a second. So um, uh, there's, I mean, emphasis on uh, kind of price, on um, blending old and new technologies, um, uh, thinking about what's the appropriate uh, functionality for a given culture, um, having the logistical infrastructure in place, um, having low skill uh, involved, um, providing education and, and so forth. Right? Um, so there's a bunch of things that you need. So if you have your dishwasher that you have in Boston, right, um, and you take it to Malawi, it's probably not going to be a, a good solution, right? Um, so, or a stove or anything else. So when you talk about bottom of the pyramid innovation, people are normally talking about this, that um, you have to design these systems, uh, these technologies for use in those harsh environments um, where there's low resource. Okay. Um, and what are the value propositions of um, bottom of the pyramid innovation? So there's, I mean, the direct value of selling goods and services to a very huge population, but um, there's more than that. Um, so anytime you're trying to innovate um, and do something really that's a breakthrough innovation, uh, constraints are a necessary ingredient and trying to do things for the bottom of the pyramid are extreme constraints that uh, force you to innovate. Right? Um, and it often turns out that um, the bottom of the pyramid solutions are actually at the end better than um, top of the pyramid solutions at radically lower price points. So um, on the left, there's an image from uh, the Arvind uh, Eye Hospital which in India, which is able to do $30 cataract surgeries with more success than uh, what costs thousands of dollars in the US um, and so forth. Right? Um, so what can we learn? Right? Uh, so if you think about it, um, so nonprofit organizations and social enterprises are actually at the bottom of the pyramid among organizations, right? So they're low resource, just like the individuals that they serve. So uh, when you think about, I mean, organizations around the world, right? Um, you have these large financial institutions, you have uh, these large tech companies, you have these... Um, uh, I mean, uh, large, I mean, organizations all, all over in different sectors and so forth. So those we can think of as the top of the pyramid among organizations. And then you have organizations like um, uh, the nonprofits and social enterprises who are at the bottom and uh, they themselves are low resourced. Okay. Um, and another important point that most people don't realize is um, that for these small nonprofits, um, their funding mostly comes from grant making foundations. And uh, that funding is specifically earmarked um, that uh, it has to be used for a particular purpose. And that particular purpose is usually programmatic efforts by those nonprofits. Um, so they're not really empowered in the use of the funds that they receive. And they're often unable to focus on things like um, uh, capacity building to make their organization more sustainable. So uh, they're not able to invest in technology, for example. Um, so what that means to us is that um, when we think about AI for social good, um, we shouldn't be seeing this as an application area per se, um, which is the typical way of thinking about it, that you're doing XYZ um, model for poverty or whatever. Um, but we should be thinking about um, AI for social good as a business model, okay? And we should be taking lessons from bottom of the pyramid innovation while we're thinking about how to bridge that gap in AI for social good. Okay. And specifically what we should be learning is um, that we, there should be appropriate functionality of the AI tooling. Um, we should be de-skilling the AI um, for people to be able to use, um, provide education, have adaptable user interfaces, um, think about distribution methods, for example, through the cloud um, that uh, are um, uh, that make it easier for the, uh, the nonprofits to, uh, to, to utilize AI and um, have these broad architectures and so forth, right? Um, 
And another important point is um, uh, just even asking the question, who decides what is social good, right? Um, so often um, when we're doing AI for social good, um, we might rely on, um, let's say a national government or an international development bank or a grant making foundation to define um, uh, what social good means for us or for, for the world. Um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, on the right are a great example of this. Um, uh, sometimes, I mean, it could be a, um, a technology company itself who thinks, I mean, we should invest in this and th they're the ones deciding that uh, this is what constitutes AI for social good. Or maybe it's the researchers themselves, they have a particular area that they want to focus on. Um, uh, I'm just kind of being facetious, but yeah, maybe Melinda is the one who decides for the world what is um, AI for social good, right? Um, and that's not the right way to think about it, um, I don't think, right? Um, so who should be deciding what is good is actually the organizations working on the ground and the people that they're serving, the, the end uh, recipients and, and so forth, the affected people. And if we think that way, what we should be saying is that AI for social good is really an instrument for empowering the people at the bottom and the organizations that, uh, that are helping them. So that's really what AI for social good should be. Um, so now how do we make this happen, right? Um, how do we not have these projects that are great in papers, but um, I mean, kind of fall apart uh, afterwards, right? Um, so in our opinion, um, there's three kind of things that we need um, to happen. So one is a funding model. Um, uh, one is common AI patterns that we can take advantage of, and one is uh, appropriate platform design. Um, so we recently conducted um, a study um, with the NYU Wagner School of Public Service um, and uh, the, the students as the part of their capstone project um, uh, did a lot of work, but one of the results that they had was um, based on interviews of grant making foundations. Um, so kind of reinforcing what I said before, um, uh, funders are more interested in mission-oriented work rather than internal capacity building work. Um, so the money they provide to, to the smaller nonprofits is meant for programmatic efforts. Um, and one thing we learned was um, uh, that the priorities and projects um, uh, that funders are going to fund are mostly set at the top level of those grant-making foundations. Um, so, and there is some, growing interest among those um, funders to uh, support AI. But um, again, there, there's this mismatch because they do feel that they should be supporting AI, but they also are only supporting kind of um, the, uh, uh, the, the mission-oriented work. Um, so uh, it's, we're kind of at this um, juncture where there might be a change happening, but it hasn't really happened yet. Right? Um, so we, what really needs to happen is some uh, reimagining of how grant making works to be more in the sort of scope of how give directly works that um, there's this unconditional um, sort of funding which empowers the organizations um, to actually do what they do. Right. Um, so this was a paper in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Um, so the second author, Hillary Pennington, is um, a leader in the Ford Foundation, and I think they are at the front of um, kind of this uh, reimagination. Right? Um, so what this picture on the left is showing is that um, uh, these grant making foundations have to put in um, funds to support the foundational cap capabilities, which includes AI, and only then can you eventually get impact. Okay. Um, so what we say is that, um, uh, to add on to this, that if you are doing AI for social good, you also need the technology solution creators involved, um, because just funding is not going to do enough. Um, you also need, um, uh, or I mean, uh, the, the tech skills to, to do this, and even that is not enough. Um, so you also need to have the design of these, um, these technologies to be inspired by the bottom of the, the pyramid. So just like... Um, uh, Simpa's model, okay? And if you do have this, um, you can uh, kind of create these uh, reusable assets that can serve as a foundation, not just for a single organization, but for many organizations who have um, similar missions and technical needs, okay? Um, and what is, I mean, so what kind of AI, what kind of solution should we be offering, right? 
Um, so this person Burgess um, categorized AI solutions into three types. Um, the first is off the shelf AI software. Second is AI platforms. And the third is um, bespoke AI builds. So the custom tailored solutions, right? Um, and in general, not necessarily talking about uh, AI for social good. Um, what he said was that the off the shelf AI software is, um, uh, I mean, I kind of morphed it a little bit, but I mean, the idea is that it's really designed for the top of the pyramid organizations that have high skill and high resources. It's not really designed for the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. Um, and then you have the bespoke AI builds, um, the custom tailored solutions, which has been the mode of operation for um, uh, the AI for social good movement. Um, so this is an actual quote from him that, uh, uh, that these bespoke builds should only be used when absolutely necessary for complex, very large data problems or when creating a completely new product that requires a competitive advantage. And that is not true for, um, for the majority of the, the social good space, in my opinion. Um, uh, it might require a completely new technology, but they don't need to have the competitive advantage that uh, needs to be kept um, as a trade secret. Right? Um, and often they don't have um, extremely large data problems. They, they're somewhat uh, smaller often. So um, uh, what we really do need is um, something along the lines of an AI platform. Um, and what does that mean? Right? Um, it means appropriate sets of foundational capabilities that can be further specialized for particular problems, trained on user data sets and deployed and maintained with relative ease, um, especially if they're delivered in cloud computing environments. Um, and uh, if you can create this foundational AI capability, you can um, create it once, um, improve it by a dedicated team on the technology side, and then as it gets improved, it gets kind of spread out and diffused to all of the different nonprofits who are the users. Okay, um, but this requires one big hypothesis to be true, which is um, that different organizations in the social sector should have similar uh, technology needs. Um, so I know, I mean, Milan and Group, you've been doing a lot on the Stackelberg games and showing it in multiple different um, uh, sort of use cases, whether it's coaching or um, uh, healthcare. Or, I mean, all sorts of things, right? Um, so that's one example. Um, and we've also, I mean, looking back at our portfolio, have seen that there are common patterns uh, as well. Um, so one example is looking at uh, more natural language processing to understand international development reports. Um, uh, second is uh, providing guidance to vulnerable individuals, which is often done as a, a causal modeling sort of task. And a third is um, uh, supporting unbiased allocation decisions. Um, so something is being offered and you want to do it in a fair way. Okay. Um, so those are all, I mean, retrospective examples. Yes, there might be common patterns. Um, so one thing we are going to be doing this summer um, in a more prospective manner is uh, to uh, involve our current social good uh, interns this coming summer, Aditya being one of them, um, uh, to actually test this idea. So we'll start from scratch, um, take uh, two or three organizations who have a similar technical need and actually try to implement um, and formulate a, uh, uh, an algorithm that applies to all of them and see if that actually can, can be um, useful in working. Um, We've kind of proven this um, through our open source toolkit called AI Fairness 360 for the um, fair allocation problem, but um, uh, not exactly in this way. So this summer is our um, big test is to see if this can, uh, can actually happen. Okay. Um, so that common patterns gets us part of the way, but it's not the whole uh, whole way, right? Um, so the other thing that we need to do is um, actually have a highly usable data and AI platform. Um, so we want to kind of simplify it as much as possible, um, to, but still be useful. Um, and what that involves is um, some sort of data catalog and management. Um, hopefully a low or no coding uh, involved so that uh, these members of the nonprofit organizations can uh, do their work um, without knowing Python and stuff. Um, uh, it should be easy to apply to a new setting with slightly different features um, because often you'll have a model, but then you get some more data. You need to, I mean, be able to bring that in or you do it for one city or one region and then you want to do it again for a slightly different region. Um, you might want to change the definition of the outcome variable a little bit. Um, uh, there should be an easy to use uh, or consume output, uh, so user interfaces and so forth. So the dashboard comment that uh, uh, came up earlier, um, 
And then on the deployment and monitoring side, um, there should be some ease of doing that because um, if organizations are going to be incorporating these into their operations, uh, that should be as, as easy as possible. And then um, uh, finally, the teaching material, the educational uh, material should be hopefully in the language of the social sector, not um, that, yeah, you have to do that translation yourself. Um, and we actually are experimenting with this already. Um, so we're using um, the help of uh, one of the IBM business units, um, the IBM data and AI uh, product division. Um, and we're collaborating with uh, one of uh, the organizations called Urban Institute. Um, and we're um, studying the problem of neighborhood change and gentrification in US cities. Um, but we're, that's the sort of uh, the subject matter, but we are also experimenting with um, how to deliver a usable platform uh, as we do this. Uh, so we're kind of extrapolating from this existing product called the IBM Cloud Pack for Data as a Service. Um, so what else do we need um, to, to make this happen, right? So one of the other things that the social sector and uh, doing AI for good needs is um, uh, trustworthiness. Um, so things like privacy, consent, data quality, fairness, robustness, explainability, um, transparency, and so forth. Um, uh, so I put in the introduction mentioned I'm writing this book, um, Trust in Machine Learning. So that's the screenshot of the cover. Um, so selfless plug there. Um, and uh, so that's, I mean, a very important point uh, that has to be part of any AI for good solutions as well. Um, and the second thing is um, the more automation, the better as well. So make things as easy as possible for these organizations. So uh, this is a screenshot from one of the IBM products called Auto AI. Um, so uh, that's just, I mean, to illustrate that, yes, I mean, there should be more automation as well. Um, and kind of the last thing I want to do before wrapping up um, is uh, kind of talk through this analogy, um, which is uh, something I've started talking about uh, over the last few weeks or so, and that's to take um, lessons from commercial aviation for AI. Okay. Um, so the first 50 years of flight, um, so we can say it started around 1903 when the Wright brothers had the first flight, um, and it ended about in 1958 with the introduction of the Boeing 707, um, which was the first commercial jet. Okay. So those first 50 years were just about how to make airplanes work. Um, and there was very limited commercialization in very limited pockets. Um, but what happened was in the second 50 years after 1958 to basically today, um, the commercial jet has not fundamentally changed at all. It, the Boeing 707 and jets today have fly at the same speed. They have the same functionality. Everything is more or less the same. Okay. Um, but what has changed is that uh, commercial airlines are now operating almost everywhere, no matter where on earth you go, there will be aircraft there. And most importantly, there has been vast improvements in safety, efficiency, and automation of aviation. Um, so on safety, for example, um, uh, since the 1970s to today, uh, the safety record, the fatalities per mile fly, flown is, I think, 200 or 300 times uh, uh, less. Okay. And uh, there's a huge amount of automation and so forth. Okay. Um, so what about AI, right? Um, so the first 50 years, uh, we can kind of mark the beginning as 1956, the Dartmouth Conference. Um, and we can say that that first 50 years about ended um, around 2012 with the ImageNet um, uh, deep learning sort of uh, mark. Okay. Um, so that first 50 years was just understanding how to make AI work, um, very limited commercialization um, as well. Okay. So where are we now? We're at the beginning of the second 50 years and um, commercialization is now starting to happen across all industries and sectors and daily life everywhere, including in the social sector. And we're just starting to focus on making AI more safe, uh, reliable, fair, trustworthy, efficient, and automated. Right? Um, so that needs to be our focus. And um, just to take the analogy just a little bit further, um, so I don't know much about flying. Uh, all I know is uh, the plane takes off, it cruises for a while, and then it lands, right? Um, and uh, when it's cruising, it's mostly in autopilot mode. Um, there's the human pilot, most of their job is at takeoff and landing, all right? Um, there's a flight data recorder and a cockpit voice recorder, which um, records everything that happens. And uh, once the plane lands, there's a lot of maintenance and repair before it takes off um, the next time. Okay. 
So when we're flying, so-called flying in AI, what do we need? Right? Um, so I think the way things are headed is that the middle step, the data preparation and the modeling, um, uh, which is uh, where we think most of our I mean, effort usually goes, um, is going to become uh, extremely automated. But um, uh, everything else, um, so uh, the problem specification and the evaluation. So what is the problem that's worth solving? How do we set it up? Um, that's where there will be a huge amount and still need for, for human uh, input, especially from uh, uh, communities of dis diverse voices and so forth, um, uh, to bring in all sorts of perspectives of what is the right problem to solve. And then on the evaluation phase, um, so were we successful or not? Um, so I think that will remain a human sort of concern, but the middle part um, uh, will become much more automated. And um, uh, perhaps the uh, the maintenance and retraining and so forth will auto also become automated in a sense, and um, we'll want to maintain some sort of visibility into what's going on using um, technologies like AI fact sheets that we've been working on at Acme Research. Um, okay, so just to finish up, um, uh, so this big picture of AI for social good that I kind of talked about um, has had its own sort of life cycle as well um, in terms of multiple phases. So there's kind of the, oops, sorry, um, the pilot and innovation phase, which is doing the um, individual projects. Um, and there's kind of the hardening and reuse sort of phase where you step back, notice what are the common patterns that emerge and develop common algorithms to address them. Then there's the deliver at scale sort of phase, which is to um, work on the platform side. Um, so where um, are there low resource and low skill people? Uh, I mean, have the ability to actually do this themselves. Okay. Um, and what we really need now is um, to have Grand Making Foundation support this idea and really kind of give permission in a sense to the sector to, to pursue this. So um, that's kind of my parting message. Um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, so that's kind of where I'll end. I'll just make one comment before that, um, which is uh, uh, as kind of engineers, um, technologists, we often are wanting scaling. I mean, that's sometimes our goal. Um, it's kind of our worldview and so forth. Um, scaling is not, I mean, always the goal for many social change organizations. Uh, we're not necessarily um, promoting scaling of organizations. They are still empowered to do what they want to do. They can remain small if they want or be um, uh, kind of growing if they want. Um, what we're advocating for is uh, the creation of scalable core AI capabilities that will make all the, all of that work um, for all of those organizations easier. Okay, um, thank you and I'm happy to take uh, more questions. Thank you for an excellent talk, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so anyone uh, who wants to, um, I mean, uh, ask questions, please uh, go ahead, please unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, so we can take uh, two questions. And then if you want a longer conversation, Kersha has kindly agreed to stay back for some more time. So mm -hmm. please feel free to join us uh, at, at 12 also. Um, so if you have questions, you can kindly unmute yourself and directly ask questions. Since nobody's stepping up, let me take the opportunity to just, uh, excellent talk. I mm -hmm. uh, appreciated the idea of empowering social change organizations themselves, mm -hmm. rather than us as AI researchers being a bottleneck in the process. And mm -hmm. three ideas you mentioned, uh, common platforms, you know, allowing, um, you know, ability to sort of ha have low overhead to use those platforms and then mm -hmm. secure or uh, trustworthy platforms. Mm -hmm. So those are all excellent. You turn this as bottom of the pyramid innovation. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand if these three ideas come from the bottom of the pyramid innovation, mm -hmm. are there other ideas or mm -hmm. uh, I guess those ideas in the bottom of the pyramid, those are the th those things I wasn't quite able to correlate very well. Yeah, so. right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you can take inspiration in different ways. Um, uh, some of the ideas kind of, I mean, the connection to the bottom of the pyramid somewhat happened post hoc, but some of it is also, I mean, um, kind of uh, perspective as well. So um, uh, I think, I mean, 
if you look at, I mean, again, any other sort of bottom of the pyramid innovation, so take a stove or something as an example, um, uh, or I mean, the way Simpo Networks does its um, kind of solar panels. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the solar panels themselves are not new technology, obviously. I mean, anyone can go buy a solar panel and put it on their house, um, but uh, the innovation is kind of on the, the, the pricing scheme, the um, installation being easy, the, the support, um, uh, the inside part, which um, allows you to connect all these fans and TVs and uh, lights and stuff to it and, and so forth. And so um, in the same way, I mean, with AI, uh, we don't necessarily always need, I mean, new models, new algorithms on the in the middle part, like the solar panel itself, but um, uh, the business model, I mean, how things are delivered, how they're supported, um, uh, some of the, the platform-ish sort of things, just like the, um, uh, the, the device inside that you connect um, uh, everything else to is where, I mean, a lot of the innovation is kind of needed. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, there's definitely a connection. I mean, you can come to these ideas in different ways as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the talk again. I, I think I was waiting for others. To, I think Rahul has a question. If not, then I'll ask. Uh, no, go ahead, 